we have 14, well, minus two, oh. 12 people online. All right. So like Beth said, my name is Heather Pisaniak. I am a technical project manager with Vibrant Planet. Um, I've been with Vibrant Planet now for about seven months, so I'm still relatively new. Um, my trade is GIS. I come from a public safety uh, background. And I am by no means a scientist. I am no mean, by no means an engineer or a forester. So um, I guess if you have very technical questions uh, concerning, you know, like topics that we cannot answer, please feel free. We'll post our uh, emails at the end of this presentation. You can reach out to ask your questions and we can ask the experts on your behalf. Awesome. Thanks, Heather. Uh, my name is Ian Hageman. Uh, GIS Systems Administrator for Fiber Planet. I've been with the company about two years now, specialized in all things GIS, um, geospatial uh, programming, automation, um, Python, um, and workflow automation. So it's uh, my intro. Get the presentation going here. <laughs> all right. So uh, I'm going to tell a little story about this weekend. I went to Midland, Texas for a wedding, and I was trying to explain to my family what it is that I do. I have a very salty uncle, very opinionated. He's been in the oil field 40 plus years, and as I started to explain to him what it is I do, he cuts me off, interrupts me, and essentially he tells me what we should do about, sorry, about the forest. We need to go in to these forests and clean up all that underbrush that's been accumulating since we've been stopping the good fires for all these years. And I was taken aback by, you know, his explanation. Like he, you know, made some very good points in, in that statement. But, you know, I was trying to say easier said than done, Uncle Jim. Um, sorry, one other thing that I scrolled past. I thought it was very interesting that there is a town very small, teeny little town in Texas called No Trees, Texas. For those of you that are geography nerds, I love finding little anecdotes like that. If you've ever been to West Texas, you, you, you can understand that the name of that town. Yes, <laughs> not, not many oil trees. fields for days. Yeah, not many trees. And here you can see kind of what he's talking about. There's a lot of overgrowth of our forests, which I'm sure many of you are already aware of that. Through the years, right, we have suppressed a lot of these good fires, as my uncle, uh, quoting my uncle, um, through historic land management, forests are overgrown, they're overfueled, right? And we have departed significantly in our landscapes. And this uh, swipe tool essentially kind of shows where we just don't let fires do their natural thing. Yeah, exactly. As, as you can see in the slider, we can see what it what it looked like, you know, 100 years ago compared to 2008. You can see just the abundance of, of, of trees that are now currently in the current condition as opposed to 100 years ago. You can see, as you referenced, how departed it actually is um, due to many factors, but some of that is fire suppression and not a lot of allowing uh, fire to be introduced into these uh, landscapes. So you can see that in action right there. So what Uncle Jimmy was talking about <laughs> was treatments, right? So he touched on two, thinning and prescribed burns. And both of those help restore forest, forest resilience, improve hydrologic systems, and protect from loss to provide ecological benefits to the landscape. Yeah, sure. So um, this is this is actually really re relevant because last night I was watching the news and eating dinner, and um, this this news story came on, which is super relevant about how about firefighters in Boulder and how they just recently did a prescribed burn yesterday, um, and this kind of segues into into what we do and how we use GIS to um, suggest areas um, for treatments. And so this is a pretty cool video. It's only two minutes long, but it's a really cool uh, story about how local. Um, <laughs> Because 
Today is a pretty small operation. Uh, we're going to hopefully run 35 acres. So today we're on Hall Ranch, which is a property in Boulder County. And our goal today is to try to burn some grass. We're hoping to treat the fuels that have accumulated over time and allow for fire to work its way back into the ecosystem on the landscape. Wildfire is still a very natural phenomenon. It's as natural as hurricanes and tornadoes. And so there's a lot of fire dependent species. Uh, ponderosa pine is one of them. That's the trees that you see here on this property are predominantly ponderosa. They like fire. That's how the cones open in the seeds and it helps them reseed. So as far as resource benefit, we're reintroducing what anciently and historically has been here before and is part of the ecosystem. Hopefully we get to put some smoke in the air and allow the, the citizens and visitors of Boulder County see what we're doing here and that not all smoke is bad. Put good smoke in the air. Um, and we don't want people to have to breathe it or anything, but a little bit of smoke now is much better than a catastrophic wildfire. I think fire management and prescribed fire is a, a never ending game. The projects that are being done today, we may not see the absolute benefit of for the next 20 to 30 years. Reintroduce fire to the landscape, help the species thrive, allow for the grasses to come back into the meadows. And we want to make sure it stays beautiful that way. Uh, and we don't have just a total stand replacement catastrophic fire. So he touched on some very good points, um, ecological restoration, uh, minimizing high intensity fires, uh, good smoke, good fire. And so, So these are some local prescribed burns that are happening. Uh, one more recent one is the Harris Park fire that is kind of near Conifer. As I was flying in on uh, Sunday, I definitely saw um, some smoke and, you know, working in public safety that's like, oh, what's on fire? Um, but it was a coordinated effort between at least five different agencies in order to uh, execute this prescribed burn. So not only are you talking about what treatments need to happen, but who all needs to be involved, who all you know needs to come together. And there are lots of different collaborations out there trying to get to the end goal of what projects to have, what treatments to use on the landscape. And that Harris Park prescribed burn was right there. So we've identified a problem, overfueled, overgrown forests, potential solution through treatments. Now, where do you start? You have millions and millions of acres, right? This is a geospatial problem, right? We are geospatial analysts. We are gonna think like geographers. So you have to coordinate between all of these different entities, what's important to them, what do they wanna protect, what, ecological effects do they want to occur on the landscape? So it's a process that's compounded and that can take years of, of planning. Well, at Vibrant Planet, we have created a um, data-driven cloud-based technology to help these communities and it's called Land Tender. It is a software platform that helps land managers identify and prioritize treatment areas coming to consensus faster. So now we're going to do, do you have anything to add to that? No. We're gonna briefly show you Land Tender and then kind of dig into what land, tan, land Tender does, what it doesn't, and then kind of get into the nitty gritty of the geospatial components. So really quick, I am, oh. How do I move that? So this is the land tender platform. When you first come in here, it's blank. You create a planning area based upon either your jurisdiction, what interests you, interests you the most, where you're looking, you know, hey, we have, you know, a million acres over here. Let's take a look, or not a million, sorry, uh, a few hundred thousand acres. So 
I created a scenario for a fire department, right? They care about safety and assets. Over on the left-hand side, you're able to see that you can weigh objectives depending on what you're most interested in. Then on the right-hand side is like a list of our, our layers, right? We have drought hazard, we have fire hazards, um, structures, your, your assets, your transportation. And essentially these are all majority um, vector layers, but then you know, uh, we have a couple that are like continuous rasters as well. All of these work in sync to, sorry, all of them work in sync to essentially weigh your objectives, right? Your different collaboratives coming together, you care about different things. Uh, safety could be hazardous materials. You don't want those to catch on fire. Those could be catastrophic, right? Uh, same with like water, we care about water quality. If you're a water department, natural resource or cultural resources, is that a archeological site that you don't want to burn? And then we also break it down by ownership. So the land is segmented, and sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. It's segmented by individual trees that are grouped and then split at jurisdictional ownership boundaries, right? So if your collaboration is say the forest service, you can't treat on um, private property. So you can your treatment is only gonna go up until uh, the private property, unless you, know, you pull that landowner in. And then we have uh, different feasibilities as well that can be turned on and off. Yeah, that's right, Heather. As, as you see on the left here, these, these objectives that you can weigh directly correspond to what's on the right here. We call them SARAs. Um, so these layers, so, you know, if you care about assets, that's going to, you know, really bring in, you know, the things that are the you know, assets, you know, the airports, the, the bridges, the utilities. If you want to weigh safety, like you mentioned, you know, the emergency service facilities. So these objectives here on the left are directly correlated to the data layers on the right. All right, any just burning questions about that? Yes. Uh, so you had a drought layer. Um, where's that data derived from? How often is it updated? Excellent question. And we'll di dive in a little bit into tree approximate objects, taking into account basal area, tree mortality, things like that. So we do have specialists that can go way, way deeper into the details for drought, but I do know. Yeah. So in, in general, the drought layer, um, if you want to turn that on, is, is based um, upon a couple of things, one of them being uh, tree density, right? So the more tree density, the, the more dense of stands of trees you get, um, the more likely that they will uh, fight for water. Um, so if there is a drought, um, the, the water resource is no longer as prevalent. Um, it's higher susceptibility to drought for those stands that are, that are um, closer, closer grouped together. Um, and water availability. So how you know how available is the water and how dense are these tree stands? Right? So in, 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 like a ponderosa pine by itself is going to be affected by drought in theory, less than a group of ponderosa pines together because they're all fighting for the same water. And it uses LIDAR and synthetic LIDAR and we'll get into that. So, okay, let's, we're gonna shift gears back to our presentation. And we have another little video for you that helps explain land tender better than, you know, more of an overview. So a couple of things I wanna point out though, you know, you'll hear things like remotely sensed data. That's, you know, the raster portion of it. Uh, co comprehensive ecological and economical information, your vectors, your SARS, your strategic areas, assets, and resources. And then it's baked in the scientific models and that's your geoprocessing. The evidence is clear. We can keep wildfires from becoming catastrophic through fuels reduction, landscape resilience, and community hardening. With wildfires now from... moving across vast areas, natural resource protectors across multiple jurisdictions must work together, strategically deploying resources across landscapes to reduce fire severity and maximize ecological benefit. Today's processes lack data transparency, timely visual local information, 
and collaboration capabilities to drive to consensus quickly and productively, nor is there an ability to consistently monitor and report on current conditions, treatment effectiveness, and resilience trends, and easily adapt plans and response. That's why we at Vibrant Planet built LandTender. LandTender is a cloud-based decision support, monitoring, and reporting platform that uses best-in-class remote sense data, comprehensive ecological and economic information, and scientific models to help natural resource managers create community risk mitigation and wildland resilience plans that maximize the restorative return on investment. That's the combination of projected avoided losses and ecosystem services benefits quantified. Plans can be adapted based on current conditions, monitoring insights, or changing priorities. In addition, land tender improves communication and collaboration between users, natural resource managers, nonprofits, indigenous tribes, and the public. The platform enables collaborators to build and share individual risk mitigation scenarios, optimize to achieve one or multiple land management objectives within available budget. Know instantly the costs and potential return on investment of a proposed plan. Get predictive analytics for project costs, workforce capacity needed, and biomass quantification. See side-by-side -side scenario comparisons to help groups more effectively weigh the trade-offs of different plans. Drive to consensus and move to implementation quickly with robust information and the ability to share contextualized decisions with the public. With Land Tender, you'll move the conversation beyond how many acres were treated to how much impact was achieved in the landscape in those acres. Community and wildland resilience is possible. Together, let's turn this into this. Land Tender by Vibrant Planet. Okay, so you may be asking, okay, why land tender? Um, the process to develop some of these projects and plans can take a long time. Gathering the data, normalizing the data, um, creating different scenarios, again, trying to get all these collaborators on board. You know, Nature Conservancy, they may care about biodiversity, fire department, safety and assets, right? We provide them with a platform to come together to make those decisions quicker, faster. We need to be deploying uh, treatments a lot faster than we have been. Uh, in some areas, you know, are just caught behind so much red tape, right? The product can also help build out um, CWPPs, community wildfire protection plans, and all those other acronyms thrown out there. <laughs> uh, again, so the goal is to get more collaboration to occur quickly. Yes, quickly. As opposed to sitting down at you know paper maps, you know a lot of times paper maps they get collaborators together and draw on paper maps. And, you know they then they go out and evaluate the, the site with plant tender. You can you know, get these these treatments and recommendations yes. like, within seconds. And it's it's a tool to help with the planning, right? You still need that ground truthing, that verification, yeah. right? That's the, the caveat, what Lantinger can't do, right? It's limited by the the data that you input, right? We all are familiar with resolution and scale. So there's give and take with data, and we will touch on that. So customizing Lantinger. I like to think about the process from the data side, getting it into the product in about three different steps. One is landscape development, and that is the, the fire modeling. Pyrologics is a subsidiary of Vibrant Planet. They specialize in fire modeling. They're based out of Missoula, Montana. And that's all I can speak to is their, their fire modeling um, is integrated into land tender. The next is the landscape ass assessment. And this is mapping trees, right? Uh, essentially identifying where the trees are using LIDAR and synthetic LIDAR. And then third, thirdly is the strategic area of resources and assets. And this is usually received by the customer, right? The, the data that's available, you know, at a county level, right? The building footprints, you know, parcels, uh, 
parks, where what essentially what they care about, what they want to protect. And so that goes through a process. We receive it, we process it, and then all of this gets handed off to our engineers. So with landscape development, Pyrologics goes, they use land fire data, modified version of that to create a fuelscape. They run it through Wildness, which uh, simulates over 200 weather scenarios. And then finally, the fire wildfire simulation. So as you can see, there are a lot of different uh, raster layers, bands used in their process. If you have burning questions about this, please email me. <laughs> yes, burning questions. Uh, and I can get the experts to, uh, uh, to fill in um, some of the knowledge gaps that I may have. So, but this, the output is the fire hazard layer that you saw initially. It comes from Pyrologics. Yeah, sure. So uh, item number two here, the landscape assessment. So we, we develop a, a canopy height model, also known as a CHM. Um, this includes, you know, the actual heights of trees, um, you know, um, yeah, so basically, so basically we take a LIDAR point, point cloud and we, you know, identify these trees and we're able to um, produce a CHM, which is basically, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with DTMs or DSMs, um, not of the terrain, very similar, except this is trees. We want to identify trees only. And so um, we ingest, you know, all these different data sources from LIDAR and, and post-process that down to one CHM. Uh, yeah, so here we have the different applications of the CHM. Um, we can segment the landscape um, into different, basically, basically similarly grouped polygons of trees. Um, we can identify tree tree size, basal area, volume, um, you know, fuel load, fire risk. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. So as you can see here, um, we, we can use this uh, CHM to segment the, well, the landscape. We can, you know, bring everything in. You use our computer models to pull out the trees. You can evaluate forest health, um, habitat suitability. You can even pull out things like asset footprints um, based on um, um, different techniques. Uh, yeah, so that's just kind of a couple of applications of the, the CHM. Yes, and we mostly use it, I would say, for the landscape segmentation. We break it out, we call them tree approximate areas or TAUs. We are saying, yes, we think this is a tree. And so as you may be aware, LIDAR is not all created equal. Data is not all created equal. So there's a lot of areas in the landscape where we don't have LIDAR data available or the acquisition date is too far in the past. We need more updated um, imagery to process. So we have a machine learning team that creates synthetic LIDAR. And it essentially takes NAEP imagery uh, well, sorry, the, the machine learning portion is this mono-depth vision transformer. It scours the internet for billions of, of photos and essentially measures the depth in those images. We apply that same technique to name imagery to apply depth to trees. And we then generate what's called um, the tree approximate objects, the tows, or that's not very good, but like individual polygons for each one of the trees. And as we know, polygons, you can have attributes associated with that. We're able to, to our best estimate, measure height, basal area. Yeah, that's a great point. And as you can see here, this graphic, how you can use images to get at depth. You can see objects in the, in the background and foreground. You can use machine learning techniques to identify these. And we're applying the same principles to native imagery, which is free and readily available in the United States. So, you know, there's areas that have LIDAR and some areas that don't. So we can use NAEP um, to map, basically map any tree in the United States um, with, with great detail. And as she mentioned, you can't really see the polygons in this, in this photo, but this is a really good representation of, um, you know, how that's used to, to map every tree using um, every tree. Yes, and the, um, we're also able to derive allometric data and use allometric data. Does this help answer some of your questions as far as what it is we're quantifying um, and all of these get bundled up into attribute outputs in land tender. So you can see 
how like approximately how many tau's there are per what we call eek objects. So we group based upon common um, common characteristics. We group them into different stands, but we call them eek objects, and they can range anywhere from uh, three acres up to I think I've seen like seven hundred acres, and that segmentation process is then intersected and cut by uh, land ownership. And then, sorry, getting to the next step, uh, it um, it punches through all of the, uh, the rasters to get attributes based upon the polygon. And then we're able to run it through, and I'll get to this in a second, uh, forces um, in order to generate the projects. So that's my progress there. Yeah, so we touched on this a little bit earlier uh, about the SARAs. Um, mostly they're vector data, um, polygons, polylines, points that we receive. Um, a lot of them are national data sets like Highfield, like the Department of Homeland Security. They have, they have good data sets on um, you know, national power lines and things of that nature. So not all data needs to be you know, curated locally, so that's nice. Um, but there also is the local data input. If a, you know, a, a customer comes to us, they say, we have this really good data set of power lines we should incorporate that's better than the data set you have, we can easily incorporate that into land tender as well. Um, as you can see here on this graph, um, you know, the, the graph of relative importance on these SARAs um, and the different objectives down here, we have recreation assets, biodiversity, carbon, just for the objectives we have. We can see a recreation site is, is a small a small portion of that, um, skiing infrastructure is a larger portion. We move over to, we can move over to like assets, and biodiversity, and, and see, um, you know how we prioritize uh, different bio biodiversity layers. This is not a comprehensive list of SARS we have. This is just an example of um, the, the the complexity of of the SARS and how they were scored um, socioeconomic uh, ecologically. So, um, and then we also I touched on this. We receive customer data. Um, collaborators work together to identify these SARS, um, what they care about, what they want to protect. And um, there's a big data processing component on, on our end, which is, you know, we, we buffer, we clip, we erase, we intersect them all, um, you know, a lot of geoprocessing, like point, point to polygon, um, and also we assign like response functions and base scores for these SARAs, like, for example, um, how, how would an Aspen stand uh, respond to a disturbance such as fire or drought, we develop scores and, and weight these, and also assign base scores, uh, right? Um, because the recreation site, like a, a bathroom in a, in, a, in a park is not going to be as important as a, a spotting how nesting site. So the base score for some of these SARS or sequoia grove, right? We want to protect this. We want to score the sequoia grove SARA much higher than that of, of, a, of like a, a recreation site or, or a trail. Not that, not saying that these aren't important, but you can weigh the different SARS accordingly. Uh, and this all feeds into the model um, and the pipeline to, to, to score things and to get uh, certain projects and treatments. Yes, there's many opportunities throughout the, the process to yeah weigh importance. It's not just taking a layer and throwing it in. So I touched on this a little bit earlier. Not all data is created equal. I think this applies anywhere, not just at, at Vibrant Planet. As you know, geospatial people, we constantly need to be aware of, you know, there could be air at the source. Our outputs could have, you know, errors baked in, and then how we use it. Uh, just always be cognizant and curious and aware. This is like my little geographer plug here, um, because you're not, you know, someone may say, "Oh, this is the best data known known to man," but as we all know, all maps lie. So, <laughs> um, and then also having like access to the data, sensitive data. I I talked about archaeology data earlier. Uh, sometimes, you know, one of the collaboratives may be all for it and want it, and the other one is, you know, they they don't want to share with us, which is fine. Like, it, it is completely up to them. Um, we just, you know, make sure that they're aware of some of the, you know, their projects may encompass one of those areas. Uh, topology is a big one. Uh, gaps, overlaps, and then attribute errors. Sometimes we receive data and it's like, okay, you said it was a park, but it is clearly a house, right? Like, what, what did you mean by park? Or, you know, just that constant, that QAQC of, of what you're looking at. Another 
uh, struggle that we have are projection differences, especially working in the uh, Western US um, and you know, using SNAP rasters and just making sure the data is as geographically representative as, as possible. So. And then once we have kind of gone through that entire process with the data, um, Ian does a fantastic job of <laughs> uh, making sure that the data that the geospatial team, the scientists all produce that uh, the pipeline needs gets uploaded. We use uh, AWS uh, S3 buckets to do that. Everything is processed at the HUC 12 level, the hydrologic unit code. And I've listed off several uh, programs there that our engineers use in order to run the pipeline. A lot of this is open source, not all of it, um, but can you help yeah. describe the pipeline a little sure. bit more? <laughs> yeah, she mentioned that a lot of the stuff is stored on AWS. All of it is actually. So, you know, as as a company, if I would plan it, we don't have any on-prem um, computers or resources other than our personal computers. So all the processing happens at the cloud of AWS, which is pretty cool. Um, you can assign different computer workers. You can you can ramp up machines. You can ramp down machines. Um, I'll, I'll be it's pricey, but it's it's really it's really uh, really really nice and um, easy, easy to work with. And and you can process massive massive amount of amounts of data in a short amount of time, which is needed for a lot of these large landscapes. Because as we referenced earlier, you know when we're mapping every tree, that that takes heavy processing. So it makes sense to, to process that on the cloud. Um, so AWS is, is the main one we use for that. We also use Astronomer um, um, for some data processing. Um, so yeah, just the data pipeline adjusts all this data, all these raster data sets, all these SAR data sets, all these um, response functions, um, fire hazard, ground hazard, all these layers. Uh, we actually have a, an internal map, an internal diagram of, of everything that feeds into the pipeline. It's a huge spinal web that leads to like an output. And it's pretty wild, but yeah, so the pipeline takes all these data sets, does much processing, and it outputs everything to this land tender application. And the, the UI team pr primarily works in uh, Mapbox. And then when you're in land tender and you go to uh, create a scenario, it uses forces to generate those projects um, to simulate and optimize management activities and examine outcomes. So, yeah, I can touch on this. And some of the programs and programs and packages we use, um, I'm sure, some of you are familiar with the bottom right one, Esri. That's a that's a that's a big one that is used globally. Uh, we don't use it a ton. We use it on some of for map making, um, but mostly um, the engineering team and the development teams we use open source packages such as um, you know GeoPandas um, and a lot of the open source Python um, libraries to to do everything. It's pretty cool because. Um, you, you know, you don't need to have the Esri integration on, on it on everything. Um, you can you know process a lot of the data using all the data using open source packages because you know there's there are many people out there that, that want to process this data and you know there's other with other ways other than Esri to, to get at that. Um, we also use PG Admin, Jupyter, Jupyter Notebooks. We use a lot just to quickly um, write code or to get outputs and Anaconda we could use to install some of our Python environments. We also use GitHub right here for a lot of our source control. Um, which is, you know, if you have a CSV, for example, and you want to submit edits, it's a good way to sort, source control your edits. You can have people review edits, and then you can always also roll, roll back to if you submit those edits. If they don't make sense or something something breaks, it's really nice as opposed to just having um, like a CSV living, like an Excel spreadsheet or something like that. You can use GitHub to check in and check out code and um, spreadsheets and things like that. Also use a little bit of R here and there. Um, but yeah, that's just a, a few of the uh, uh, many different... <laughs> Application we use, I use QGIS and well, ArcGIS all the time. QGIS is, is, is great. It's a great open source um, tool to quickly view data, do simple geo processing. ArcPro and ArcMap are great for making maps, of course, and then all these intermediaries are, are great for, for geo processing. So it's really kind of the of view of everything. Is. And I want to touch on how spoiled we are because we have such a uh, robust engineering team. Um, I know, you know, if you're a smaller shop from a GIS perspective, you know, Esri kind of dominates that realm, right? They are the industry standard for GIS, uh, unless you have an awesome engineering team to help bridge that gap, right? I know uh, from my education, you know, it was Python 
integrated into uh, ArcGIS, and this has really opened up uh, a lot, uh, uh, really opened up my eyes to a, a lot of um, alternatives, which to keep your mind open, but no one from Ezra is listening. <laughs> <laughs> So before we get back into land tender, I uh, kind of wanted to go over a couple of things to understand, better understand this process a little bit more. I've been here seven months and I'm still like, wait, hold on, yeah. <laughs> uh, pump the brakes. So again, going back to those SARS, that, uh, that value that we assign, uh, bumping it up against the natural hazard, fire, drought, and then coming up with a risk score and then the potential likely treatments. We have over 20 different combinations of likely treatments. Uh, and here's a list that, you know, the top main ones and then there's subcategories. Um, I guess that's the response or the, the treatment and then there's a method associated with it as well. And so each SARA, you know, it does this evaluation and you can, in land tender, you can say, okay, yes, I want to protect from loss or I want, you know, the, um, the ecological benefits from that. We call it enhanced something, <laughs> enhanced effects, right? Or you could balance the two, right? You essentially have three options if you want to be, you know, avoided loss or have this treatment effect. So um, we essentially do the same thing. We talked on departure desired like uh, conditions. And, and, and just real quick on the, on the treatments, you know, because, you know, in, in, in space and, you know, the topography, there's different, um, you know, different slope, you know, aspects, elevation, things like that. So not all treatments can be applied to the same area, right? So for example, if herbivory, which is basically grazing, you know, you can't use that on a high, really high slope mountain at 10,000 feet, right? So we want to assign a different treatment there. So land tender takes all that into consideration and won't assign those treatments for those areas. So it's pretty cool that you can get um, these different treatments where they're supposed to be, as opposed to just assigning random treatments anywhere or um, of that matter, because um, it, there is high variability in the, in the landscape topography. So. A lot of math is involved in the pipeline. Too. Yeah. So essentially what we're going to see now is going to be the restorative return on investment. So we take avoided loss plus the ecological effects gives you your uh, accumulative restorative return on investment. So the darker blue is a higher and then the lighter blue is lower. So I'll show you what that means in a second. We're gonna go back. Here. So if I were to create a new scenario, um, let's say I like my fire department because I used to work for a fire department. Uh, assets and safety. Uh, well, let me do this one at a time. So I, again, weigh my objectives. I want to protect from loss assets. And so the darker blue areas, remember, are your higher restorative return on investment. And if I turn on assets, you'll see that the, where the SARS more like densely are, reflect a higher um, restorative return on investment. And where there's no, um, no structures, no transportation, no assets, you're not gonna see um, the restorative return on investment. Yeah. And so we can get in a little bit more detailed. We're only gonna have RROI sort of return on investment in areas where this area exists. Yes. If we get in here, you can see those polygons, they're, you know, the, the towels, those trees like grouped together. Like to show here is we can look at the attributes and this is what I was talking about. It punches through all of those different layers, quantifies how many acres this is how many acres to treat your uh, above ground live carbon biomass. Uh, and you, land tender allows you to export all of these attributes out. So if you didn't want to bring it into ArcGIS, if you did have additional uses, I wanted to go to the, the tau count. So like how many trees 
are we uh, predicting or expecting in there? To, so we're saying that there's about 156, this is an estimate, 156 trees in this area. We are also able to say, okay, I want to treat, you know, 3,000 acres and I have 1.5 million. No, that's a lot. <laughs> and uh, per, per project, right? So say I have, you know, 1.5 million over the next three years, right? This would be yeah anyway so i'm just gonna put three in there i'm not this hard today and then this is what i was talking about the balanced priorities you can say i just all i care about i want to protect from loss versus that enhanced function takes into account more of that ecological effect the balance is a combination of the two i'm not going to run this because it takes forces a little while to 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 chug through it and that's why i created a couple of examples and then you are able to like reiterate, right? Like you get an output and you're like, well, that doesn't you know, look right, feel right. You can um, reiterate on these things. So I created one for fire department, safety and assets. And it came up with, I said five projects. I think I did 20 million or 20,000 acres and then like 5 million per project. Um, and we can zoom, this is like the first project, what it you know suggests. And if we look a little bit more closely, right, you're able, that's a pretty big, pretty big parcel there. Uh, so it's about 121 acres. It's predicting that it would cost about just under uh, 200 grand to treat uh, about 121 acres. Um, other landowners, we know it's, um, you know, private, this is not on forest service, it's not on BLM, right? So you can set constraints, like if you were the BLM or, you know, if you were an entity that, you know, okay, I only want to focus on my property, we call those distinct management areas. Uh, I didn't bring one in in this case, but it won't look at anything but the area of land that you most care about, that you want to treat. Uh, we have the HUC ID and then a bunch of short codes. So yes, Question in the back. Yeah, I'm curious how you come up with that cost. Like, do, if, if, do you take into account like various markets and different locations? Because like treating around Lake Tahoe, I'm guessing is very much different pricing than sure. in the middle of Nevada. Yeah, not currently. A lot of the work currently is being focused around um, California. That's where we started. Um, so all these, I think, are just average costs um, for California. Um, as we move into and expand into other landscapes, I, I imagine that that cost will change. Then I have one other question. Yeah, um, please. I'm curious how you adjust the like ecological benefits for different forest types because the story that you are selling this on is lower lower elevation, frequent fire forests, and obviously there's a lot of forests across the Western U.S. that are not that. So how? Do sure. You, are you talking like hardwood, those? softwood? Or I mean, like mixed conifer, uh, spruce fir, anything that isn't a lower elevation ponderosa pine dog in the forest. That is an excellent question. I yeah, and I know like that they they do do but like like ecotype and like ecoregion, and I know that like, they do parse out softwoods and hardwoods. Um, I'm not exactly sure how um, we map that or how it's integrated. Um, but I, I believe they are taking that into consideration. Um, other I, I don't know how, but I, here we have aspen stands, sequoia groves, um, that uh, oak woodlands that we've been able to pull out from, I believe, this like the lidar and synthetic. Again, that goes into the prioritization. Uh, and, so I guess, it, I mean, do you think that like when you're like this polygon here, it looks like there's probably a couple of mix of forest types is what I'm guessing? Do you, would you adjust the treatment type that you're suggesting or the prioritization of these treatments based off of a forest type or no? I don't have the answer off the top of my head. That's an excellent question. Um, please touch base with me afterwards. I would, I would love to get your an, uh, an answer to you uh, about that. Sorry, that's a very specific question. Um, but I do know based upon the polygon, the treatments 
uh, do change. I just don't know if that is um, baked into that, if that makes sense, right? I think if it was a species that you you want to, you know, protect, that's an excellent question. I, I do not know. Ian, anything else? Uh, no, I think that just that shows a great. So if you want to just maybe zoom out, Heather, please go quick for me. So um, to the entire landscape, maybe. As we see here, um, um, in this entire AOI, in a perfect world, right, it'd be great to treat everything. But but we can't. And so we have to prioritize, right? And so this is this is this is a great way to look at our ROI and prioritize areas almost instantly. And you can see these five projects. Um, Oh, there's a scale dependency. Oh yeah. So as we can see here, right? You know, in a perfect world, we can trade this, treat this entire AOI, but we don't have the time. We don't have the money. So basically, where where can we focus our money and resources um, and protect things we care about? Um, uh, yeah. And then within the project, um, here are the treatment methods that are suggested how many acres per you know, each treatment. So as you can see, the um, for safety and assets, you're mostly in and around like homes, dwellings. So um, you know, mechanical removal would be you know, the um, suggested treatment for that area versus if you're in like a wilderness, you know, this will change depending on where you're at. You know, it will be a higher uh, prescribed fire, for instance. And then how many acres? Uh, estimated cost, and then the product benefit, like how much can you get in return from selling to uh, sawmills? And I don't believe that that is like regionally um, uh, parsed out, right? Again, we're average, yeah. focused mostly in California and Pacific Northwest at the moment, at the moment, right? Uh, I also forgot to mention we are a startup company too, so <laughs> we are uh, very much in development phase as yeah. well, taking into these types of considerations as we expand. So you can, yeah, the breakdown Bureau of Land Management has 78 acres. They may want to treat their land differently than, you know, the, the local government, right? But they still need to work together if they want to, you know, optimize uh, their finances, so. We have a question from the chat. Yes. Um, from Ben, does it differentiate between mechanical and handwork based on slope? I, I believe so, yeah. I, I, know, I know slope is a, is a consideration in there. That's one of the rasters that's produced uh, on these treatments. And so I know there it is factored, I'm not exactly sure how, um, but I know that slope is is factored into the, to the treatments and the treatment effects. I had another question kind of related to, you're talking about all the weighting before. I was wondering who decides the weight? Like, are you, who are you, I guess, who are you consulting with yeah. to decide on those? Weights? Yeah, that's a, yeah, um, that's a great point. So the, the, the whole you know point of land tender is that these collaborators can get together, right? So, you know, we can get the water district together along with the fire department, along with the nature conservancy, who obviously can care about a lot about biodiversity. And then you can each create your projects and then you can create consensus scenarios. Where do our objectives overlap? Where do we, you know, if, if one person weighs high biodiversity, one person cares about safety, where can we find these areas where you're, you know, you're getting a high ROI, ROI of things you care about, and also I'm getting a high ROI of things I care about. So that way you can have a, a, coll a collaborative um, project that explains, you know, that shows that kind of, you know, can come to a consensus on the different objectives that, that the different collaborators, collaborators care about. I think we've still not had meetings like that so far. Like yeah. Like we've had those discussions. Yeah. I, mean, I feel I, like sometimes they end up being fairly contentious. And oh, no, they, they are. And yeah. I know. Yeah. Consensus to do something. Oh, like 100%. Yeah. Heather and I don't sit in on those a lot, but we have you know, people on our team, like Joe Flannery and, and others, that they, they, they're they part of these um, workshops. And they, <laughs> they do get heated and, you know, you know, but it's, it's you know, the whole point is to like, let's work together and try to, you know, get this together. And Lantern is an awesome platform for that because, you know, you can easily see the consensus areas that I actually show here. Um, 
Yeah, so in this example, um, she took like a, a fire department scenario with nature conservancy and a water department. And then you can see a consensus scenario. There's 2,000 2, acres, one project. And then you can zoom into that um, uh, project and look at look at the different metrics of the, of the treatment and, and, and see where your priorities overlapped. And then you can kind of work from there. Um, this doesn't tell you what to do. All this does is recommend. So then it's, it's up to them to facilitate the treatments and to get boots on the ground. But uh, land tender, you know, is a great tool to help inform, not to um, actually do the work. So, you know, you still need those collaborators to still, you know, um, you know, to complete the work. But land tender rec can recommend um, when and where, um, not or sorry, not what, when, but where and how to do the treatments. Yes. Yes, yeah, I think this is really cool, and um, uh, it just kind of makes me think about a different thing um, that's like. Probably just as complex and maybe more important would be reducing carbon emissions like by communities. Yeah. And I wonder, like, is there any talk about using a tool like this to help communities plan to, like, you know, get their emissions down to zero? Well, there has been talk about carbon sequestration built within. We do have, you know, like live carbon. It, everything that's mapped is, has to be above above ground, right? So you notice there's like no soil. In yeah. here, right? Um, yeah, we have a few things on the roadmap as far as carbon emissions. I don't think that specifically. Are you talking like are you talking CO two emissions? Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, interesting. We have, I don't I don't believe we could even have considered that. Um, are you so like can you leverage a little more like are you just talking like, about like you know county level you know community planners trying to be like okay how do we Get our emissions down to zero. Like, where do we put the windmills? Like, how do we design the new train system, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, to like get carbon emissions to zero by like twenty thirty five? Yeah, you know. I see. Okay. Yeah, that would take it. That would take a, quite a bit of development, but yeah, that's that's a, that's a great idea. Um, not currently on our roadmap, though. You'll find different layers. Yeah. You'll find different. Yeah, right. I think like what you're You'll saying like is very same layers actually. Yeah, so the... it's, you're prioritizing like. Prioritize, you know, use that to prioritize kind of like that. So oh, I'm just thinking that, sorry. I was going to say, so there's a project called Colorado Brightfield, which is kind of doing what you're saying. It's turning blighted, like vacant areas and doing a priority, like index factor thing for parcel that will be a good candidate for solar and wind. Cool. And it's based on um, the fact that it's, a wasted space and near the electric grid and has good sun and has good wind. Anyway, Colorado right field. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for bringing that up. Yeah. Because, yeah, currently, Lenten, we prioritize like disturbances such as like uh, fire um, is it because kind of wildfires are going rampant right now, not only in the Western United States, but worldwide. And so, um, pretty much just fire right now. Just, you know, we have this area. How can we treat this? What if we have we try to tie things to prevent and make fire, you know, communities more resilient and adapt to these fire? Yes. Um, so you guys have talked a lot about the, the tree polygons and how you're using LIDAR and synthetic LIDAR to create these tree maps. Are you pulling in? I know you talked about with some of the fire layers, they're using land fire data. Are you pulling in other layers like surface fuels, vegetation, you know, down dead woody debris as far like to contribute, or are you just doing this solely on trees? Like grass? If that is built into the fuel scape, okay. yes. Uh, and so I touch on that in modified fuel scape. I know like FBS is also used, uh, tree map. Um, that is one of the, like the down fuels is one of the, the I think, biggest hurdles that our, our scientists are, you know, having to deal with um, in their models that they build out. I'm trying to think what Kat told me on that. Um, that would have to, yeah, go back back to the fuel scape, all the different layers. I don't know how it's modified. Um, I think it does account for some, yes, you know, we use the NDVI to identify, you know, live dead, but when there's so much canopy cover, I know it's really hard to, to quantify, you know, like, what's in between the ground and, you know, the trees that you can see because it's so densely packed in there. Mm -hmm. um, I don't believe we are accounting for that because it's, you know, un either unreliable data or, you know, the 
area that you know we're looking at is so huge. Um, question with paralogics our paralogics team that yeah. the, the bread and butter butter is mapping fire hazard fire probability and yeah, it's not a very you know system that takes in all these different um inputs and uh, yeah i'm not exactly sure all the, the inputs to that um but they they are professional than that and um i i don't i'm not exactly sure how that's incorporated in that. I hope that helped answer your question <laughs> yes so for um you're putting in all this stuff into the model that's providing a solution that's both spatial and financial. Is there like multiple scenarios that like optimizes for a lower cost? Or like how is that solution generated? So you're able to set constraint budget constraints down here. Um, that I guess yes, that is your constraint for optimizing, right? Like we only have X amount of money, and so that is processed through forces to generate projects knowing your budget. So uh, underneath that, are you allowed to say it or, or like give it like, I want to see several different solutions or is it just like somehow weighted in your model that we're gonna add all these together and take its mean average and here's your cost and here's your solution or is it providing like an average of several different models in this simulation? I think that's where the projects come in. It gives you different areas Am I not? I don't think I'm understanding your question. All um, the different project I'm areas. I'm like, just curious if the underlying math or formula or algorithm that generates a spatial solution. And it's okay. Yeah, well, so, so we have like the cost for a treatment. And we have to, if, if that treatment is recommended for that for that polygon of trees, uh -huh. that, that, that's what we, we get at the cost. We don't use different, you know, costs for that treatment. Is that what you're asking? Like, because we have a, a, a treatment and the cost associated with the treatment. So if we select that polygon, we say this prescribed fire and this polygon is going to cost 10 grand. Um, I, I, I'm not sure how you or to iterate on that. Or it, I, is that kind of what you're asking? Like if, if the prescribed fire was not 10 grand or like. Um, we can chat. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yes, please, Sorry. please. Thank you. We have another it, question in yes. the chat from uh, Nick, who's at the Colorado State Forest Service. What is the current data update cycle for Chirologic? Hydrologics products integrated into land tender. For our latest clients, very recent. <laughs> very recent. Um, Hydrologics is a, uh, a new acquisition of Vibrant Planet. And so our immediate customers have not, you know, received that updated information yet. So as far as like the cycle goes, right? When they are available, it's built into the contract essentially that we have with the customer on when they receive a data refresh and they also get new fire data. Does that help? Nick? <laughs> I hope so. I'm not <laughs> misspeaking either, but it seems like every time. <laughs> oh, thanks Nick. <laughs> Yes, because it takes into account, um, you know, treatments that have occurred, disturbances that have occurred, so recent wildfires um, that have been prolific. Um, is it updated after big events? Like, is it is the update triggered by events, or is it just like a no once a year? Yeah, it's more about once a year because the um, to run it through the pipeline, right? It's not reaching out. We have to like process it before it goes into the pipeline and then that just that just takes time right it's not like the pipeline is reaching out to like different um rest endpoints if you will pulling it down and then processing it we still have to run it through the wildest simulation it takes time. yeah it, it takes time it, it's it's a lot faster than doing it on your own but it still is a, a little bit of a tedious process so um any other questions on that? Um, another one just for me, but I know it is one o'clock. So if oh. anyone has to go, like don't feel bad if you have to leave. But uh, Ben has another question. Do you make these data available, specifically risk data to third parties or insurance companies? If they, I know if they there, purchase it. There is talk about, about that because obviously insurance companies care about risk to communities and fire risk, fire hazard. Um, I know there's some internal discussions. Um, right. Um, I don't facilitate those, but I know there, there's some internal discussions with, with insurance and others. So it sounds like not currently, but 
maybe yes there are and yes discussions of yeah that. it's funny and, one of our other seminars was about insurance a couple weeks ago oh or yes okay any other question um i'm curious so like who is your target audience so like this is a like a, a tool that people would pay for is that right um are you hoping to have like the forest service or different private landowners or PNC like pay for this service or different fire departments and then they would plan their plan their treatments through this through the service is that correct yes and yeah that's right the entities you just named off okay. are yes um, is, either existing or pursuing clients mm -hmm. yes is this is is land tender like does does like the product change at all dependent on location or dependent on like that different organizations like specific objectives or is it like one big machine yeah. <laughs> so oh. yeah no so for um for example like for the, some of the um customers we're starting to go into you know we have our base you know saras you know which are you know transportation utility lines and things like that but the client can definitely provide uh, their own data um with their own objectives that way so say they have um some other you know what Obviously, like a California spotted owl, if they have some, some sort of local biodiversity things they care about or some building footprints they care about, like critical infrastructure, we can absolutely incorporate those, incorporate those into land tender, tender and, and, and run scenarios based on locally curated data. Can I ask who, who currently like, has, has used this? Or... Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I um, like the, the Truckee, uh, Truckee uh, Fire District, mm -hmm. California, the Tahoe National Forest. Um, we have some partners, uh, other partners at PG&E, they own uh, their utility company out of California. Um, Placer County, yeah. um, which Just is county. Me. They need you to use this. No. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, yeah. And so it's a lot of, a lot of, it's not just national forests, it's, you know, right. local fire districts, uh, counties, man county managers, um, um, national forests, things like that. One other very short question. Uh, in one of your scenarios, it looked like there was a button up at the top left that said, I'm feeling resilient. Oh. What is that button? <laughs> yeah, is it, is it like a couple I'm feeling lucky search or like, I, like, this is the best possible scenario? Maximizes resilient return on investments. So if you don't want to weigh anything, you just want to click this button. How do I get the highest ROI instantly? Maybe you can give this button, but usually we like to prioritize. Yeah, this so that's highest. Are are yeah. high regardless of what weights are important to you? Yeah. Yes. So like how would you know, hit that button? These areas are like hugely like you need a huge ROI that is treating these you know in the near future. Yes. And I just want to kind of double check. Just Thanks. talking about the data, a lot of these data sets they're all like open data, like from the federal government, land fire, NLCD, but you're just putting it together in such a way that it makes it cool. Exactly. So technically, right. anyone could make a tool themselves. Yes, but it would not. They, they tried. <laughs> yeah, it takes, and it kind of goes back to uh, that one slide, like the planning part of it uh, of doing something similar like this takes years. Yeah, right. Um, it's packaging it. It's, it's, so I just came from the Phosphor G conference. So it's all about like, is it free? But well, you can pay for convenience. And so oh, all that's in my head. Yeah. So it's just, and maintenance. Yeah. And, yeah. So that ties to the next question for the Audrey. What kind of costs are associated with using this tool, such as a starting point? That's an excellent Which question. Is, we can get you in touch with yeah. our, our sales department. We are not sales people. We, we are geospatial. It, it depends on the size. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Our, our, our costing is acres based, right? Yeah. Um, and obviously, there's economies of scales discount as you get larger. You know, um, you know, the more acres you, you know you get, but, you know, because economies of scale, you know, it'll be more expensive, but it'll, the base price will be cheaper. So, um, it, it, it varies so much on the on the, on the landscape. Um, and then, how many like stars you want to, you know, custom stars you want to include, right? There's a lot of different differing factors. Yeah. So, yeah. well, why don't we wrap it up? If anyone has additional questions, you can chit chat while we pack up here. Uh, thanks everyone for coming in person, and thanks for having us. Thank you for having us. Thanks everyone for coming online. Yes. Hello. Oh, thank you. I'm sorry, um, I'm insane. We had a good crowd. <laughs> um, if if you have any questions, if anyone has any questions, yeah, please. You can, email um oh, their thanks. email is on screen or you can email even just like gis at colostate.edu and we'll get you in touch yes please um and we recorded this and we'll post it soon okay uh, 
we uh, it's unlisted, but we put, just post the link, so it's not like public. Perfect. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for coming. Thanks Thank for coming, you all. Everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.